name is Dr. Jean Elphick. I am the General Manager of the Africa Tukun Empowerment Programme and this presentation speaks to the responses to sexual violence affecting children with disabilities in South African townships. The Africa Tukun Empowerment Programme is really a programme which started off focusing very clearly on children with disabilities but now also includes a very strong gender-based violence component and also has a look at other, other at-risk groups of children and young people. So today what this program or this um, presentation will cover is just a snapshot of the types of violence that we have encountered um, affecting children registered on our programs and some of the responses that our programming has developed to try and mostly focus on preventing sexual violence. So before we begin, there is quite a bit of um, research, although still significant research gaps, which link um, additional vulnerabilities of disability with sexual violence and this is specifically also with relation to children. There's also a good body of research linking exposure to violence, abuse and trauma to disability. So um, these um, things where disability, intellectual and psychosocial disabilities um, and developmental delays can predispose children to abuse abuse and violence then also predisposes them to um, disabilities. In South Africa specifically, it was found that children with intellectual disabilities are between three and eight times more common in abused than non-abused children. And so despite the fantastic um, range of comprehensive human rights legislation which is enacted in South Africa, and despite South Africa having um, signed and ratified not just the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child but also the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, significant barriers to not only child protection but also access to justice remain, specifically in the, in the, where it comes to children with disabilities. So just by way of warming you up, um, a short anecdote um, and uh, what is on screen now are excerpts from a um, letter uh, that was um, received just this month um, in response to a case brought to the South African Human Rights Commission in 2014. Um, Basically, the, the letter outlines the reason that this case was brought. So it was about um, surrounding concern about a centre um, for children with disabilities um, where multiple instances of rape and sexual assault against children with disabilities um, had been heard about and spoken about. It just, um, these cases and, and these incidents had been reported um, by multiple parties, not just to the South African Police, not just to the Department of Social Development, but also to the Department of Basic Education. And um, after four, just less than four years, um, the response has now come that the um, case is now going to be um, closed and that the Commission, the South African Human Rights Commission, is satisfied that the um, centre has put in place some child protection measures. But what's quite clear is that where there are concerns about sexual violence specifically affecting children with disabilities and where these cases are brought, brought forward to duty bearers, really the response um, is lacklustre at best. So if we have a look at um, the Africa Tukun Empowerment Programme and if we have a look across 
um, the children with disabilities who are known to our, um, our programs. At this point, we have just over a thousand um, clients registered on the empowerment program, some of whom may be young adults, in addition to children with disabilities. Um, we undertook an audit of secondary data in our client case files, um, and we came across 27 um, cases where a um, child or young adult with a disability um, or a caregiver of theirs had disclosed to our staff some instance or incident of violence. Um, at that point there were 18 female and 9 male clients and their ages ranged between 6 and 27 years old. If we have a look at the types of um, disabilities that we're talking about here, the most common was an intellectual impairment, but um, other diagnoses also included cerebral palsy, bipolar disorder and some, some other psychosocial um, disabilities and also Down syndrome. If we drill down into that, that 27, uh, those 27 um, clients um, and have a look just at the um, clients who are children, there were 18, and of children who experienced sexual violence, um, we get down to a number of 18. When we look at the types um, of uh, sexual violence which was perpetrated or disclosed. Um, by far the most common um, was rape. So rape um, was disclosed amongst nine and sexual grooming um, had affected one. What's also interesting is when we have a look at the sort of reporting of these incidents um, and it's quite clear that um, the majority of these cases had been reported and have been reported um, and that may well be because um, these clients are all registered um, on the empowerment program and part of the program includes an advice and referral service so where um, especially where uh, recent cases um, of any kind of violence uh, or any kind of criminal activity affecting children are disclosed. Um, the families or the, the client themselves are supported to go through the correct procedures um, with respect to reporting um, and opening cases with the police. Four of these clients did not want to um, report and um, and did not had not reported um, and, and that's to date and um, for some of these the reason was that um, the incidents had happened um, many years ago and the um, family and children had decided that they did not want to open a case um, however as you can see the majority have reported um, to uh, one of the three places where you can report sexual abuse um, or violence in South Africa and that those include at the police, at a, um, a hospital, a state hospital or at a Tutuzela care centre. Um, none of our clients had um, actually reported at a Tutuzela care centre um, just one of them had reported at a, at a health facility, but the rest had all um, reported to the police and um, three of them had actually reported multiple times and clearly um, these incidents are happening, but as we know um, and as with all gender-based violence related um, statistics, especially in South Africa, in, in our context, we know that there are there is really a, a very big underreporting of these kinds of incidents. The mere fact that the majority of the cases that were reported were um, included rape um, 
really points to the fact that um, uh, sexual assault, sexual grooming, these kinds of sexual violence are thought or perceived to be less important or the type of thing that families would just prefer to uh, forgive and forget. Uh, whereas rape is seen as, as, as more severe and um, more worthy of speaking out about. So what I'd like to talk about now um, is a little bit more about the, our responses and um, the types of interventions that we have started implementing um, amongst our clients, um, not only amongst children with disabilities, but we also run programs um, that target young children in our early childhood development centers, so children from age three to six. We also run clubs um, for children in child and youth development programs, and those um, children are um, part of after school programs and they run from age 7 up to 18. We then have a club for um, out of school um, young adults who would still like to remain active in, in our empowerment groups. And then finally we also have um, self-help groups or community-based rehabilitation empowerment groups for family members, mostly mothers of children with disabilities. So um, we have several studies and, and some resources for, uh, that are available for people to have a look at. Um, the first is um, a, an evaluation of the outcomes of um, a community-based rehabilitation empowerment program specifically amongst caregivers of children with disabilities at our first um, pilot site where we started the empowerment program. And um, this really speaks about the outcomes of running a weekly um, self-advocacy group for, for caregivers of children with disabilities, mostly mothers of children with disability. And it um, presents some of the outcomes of a transformative research study which has been implemented amongst the caregivers um, since 2013. And um, it really speaks to the way that um, being part of this intervention has not only boosted the way that caregivers feel about their power to tackle issues affecting children with disabilities. For instance, um, the, their self-confidence in talking to and engaging with duty bearers, um, and also um, dealing with their own experiences of sexual um, and gender-based violence. So, for instance, um, one quotation from a case study interview conducted in 2015 um, with a mother of a child with a disability said, Now I know how to make decisions for myself, despite what people think. I do what makes me happy now. I used to be a victim of abuse, and every time I wanted to make a decision, I would think of my husband and my parents, but now no one can tell me what to do. In 2012, I knew that I had rights, and every woman has a chance to make to live her life, but I didn't realize that I had the power to change things. Um, and what this really speaks to is um, the some of the effect of not just the peer support um, and, and ongoing um, sort of supportive community which a self-advocacy group provides, but also about elevated levels of constitutional literacy. So just um, the some of the effects of learning more about what it is that our South African Constitution um, stands for, what the rights um, of all citizens are, regardless of their gender or disability or any other um, grounds for discrimination. Um, but also um, around the quite comprehensive sexuality education which which we have been implementing. So 
the caregivers really highlighted that the comprehensive sexuality education course that they completed said that they, it was number one and the most important education opportunity that they'd accessed through the empowerment program. Um, one of the caregivers said, um, and this is a quote from a focus group discussion that was conducted in 2015, we are taught to make our children aware that people are not allowed to touch their private parts. This has made a huge difference because our, child, our children are not being sexually abused anymore. Now, this may well be a premature um, and over-enthusiastic statement, but certainly when we had a look at the, the net effect of um, increased agency of caregivers who participated in the self-help groups, um, and the sort of shifting um, um, political and social and um, economic structures within which they are embedded, we, we really did see a shift and an, an improved access of children with disabilities to their human rights. Um, and this was, this was really um, seen um, and articulated in terms of Section 12 of the um, South African Constitution, which is the right of people to safety and freedom, um, which includes the right to be free from all forms of violence, not to be tortured in any way, not to be treated or punished in a cruel, inhumane or degrading way. And so caregivers said that, you know, even though violence still remains a problem in their community, um, they felt that they were better equipped to prevent abuse and that they knew what to do and how to respond if um, a, an instance of abuse or, or violence did occur. They had also shifted things in the, in the opportunity structure in their environment um, and one of the ways that they had done this was by um, pushing for and participating in the launch of a disability desk at the local police station and they really think thought that this was something that um, that had made a difference but going back to the general education on um, human rights um, and human rights literacy um, I just want to share one last um, quotation with you again from a focus group um, in 2015 a caregiver said I feel like my child is safe now because I know his rights and I've been taught about rape and how to fight for my child's rights. So the caregivers really did emphasize um, the, the value of sexuality education. So what um, we started off doing was running a, um, a train the trainer course um, for caregivers of children with disabilities using a um, education program put together by the Western Cape Forum for Intellectual Disabilities um, and we taught caregivers um, and took them through a, this manual which is called All About Me and it's a comprehensive life skills, sexuality and HIV AIDS education program specifically designed for learners with uh, intellectual disabilities or, or cognitive deficits um, and after um, initially um, having caregivers um, entrusting them to not only talk to their children about um, sexuality and, and life skills um, and how to make decision healthy decisions about their bodies how to understand relationships um, and um, things like being feeling confident to say no and make decisions about your body. We started um, realizing that a helpful approach to um, providing this human rights education and sexuality education in particular would be um, peer education. So we also have um, some reports on the peer education program which we have um, piloted initially in a school for children with educational support needs, um, so a, a special school. But essentially peer education is a process 
whereby well-trained and motivated young people undertake informal or organized educational activities with their peers, though similar to themselves in age, background or interests. These activities, occurring over an extended period of time, are aimed at developing young people's knowledge, attitudes, beliefs, and skills. I'm a young advocate and I'm a proud peer educator. My name is Nawet Spiegel. I'm a young urban man and I'm a peer educator. We're teaching people um, like about life, our rights. People know things, but then they're not sure of them. So if we teach them, then they are they know about them. So it's like we are the teachers. When I look here and I see like we have older people and younger people coming together to achieve a common goal, I think it's better because it's a matter of he's at that level, he can approach people at his level. She's that level, so she can approach people at her level. Someone who can adopt to any situation, who does not have problems with anyone and who does not choose the color or the culture. We get to teach them the way they understand us. Um, we spend more time with them. So we, 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 we don't only teach here, but we teach wherever we are. My name is Kuto Ratao and I study at Duzen and Lela. I study agriculture and architect. I am a peer educator. Hi, I'm Nobukanya and I'm a young urban woman and I am a peer educator. Hi, my name is Happiness Loud. I'm in grade 6. Uh, I'm everybody. Hi, everyone. My name is Petronella Chiflara. I'm an active citizen and I'm a peer educator. So the advantages of peer education is that like we get the knowledge we don't expect from our parents like we're learning in a comfortable and what's this welcoming area because like we understand one another since we are teenagers and stuff like that people tend to think that young people don't have uh, the abilities to be successful without adults or without any care but i believe that we can only if we set our minds to it and we have people who can support us <laughs> 